campus of Rice University in Houston, Texas, the Baker Institute for Public Policy presents Selective Engagement, Principles for American Foreign Policy in a New Era. A lecture by James A. Baker III, 61st Secretary of State. And now, the President of Rice University, Dr. Malcolm Gillis. Good morning. I am once again pleased to introduce our next speaker. His presence here today is a special honor for Rice University and the Human Genome Organization. For nearly a century, the history of Jim Baker's family has been tightly intertwined with the history of Rice University. His grandfather and namesake, Captain James Addison Baker, twice rescued this university from great peril. I'm very proud to say that this association of the Baker family with Rice University continues today. Our speaker has played the pivotal role in the creation and furtherance here at Rice of the internationally focused Interdisciplinary Institute for Public Policy that will bear his name. Jim Baker is one of America's most distinguished public servants. White House Chief of Staff, Secretary of the Treasury, and Secretary of State. These are three of the most demanding jobs that American government, indeed government anywhere, can offer. Our speaker not only filled these jobs, but in a real sense, he defined them for his successors. In the process, as Secretary of Treasury from 1985 to 1988, he helped to ignite the, mo the most significant round of worldwide tax reform of this century. As Secretary of State from 1988 to 92, he was a guiding spirit in forging the conditions that finally led to the historic joining of hands of former Mideast adversaries on the White House lawn last September. A bit of history that you might find interesting. Twice in roll call votes, the Senate of the United States confirmed Mr. Baker unanimously, first as Secretary of Treasury and then as Secretary of State. His remarks today will focus on today's international political uncertainties and upon how this country might successfully na navigate through these uncertainties. He speaks with some authority as the man who guided the United States safely through the implosion of communism and the end of the Cold War. Statesman is a much abused term in this day and age. I present happily a native Houstonian who ranks among the leading statesmen of this or any other generation, James a. Baker III. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Gillis, for that uh, very, very generous uh, introduction. Dr. Kasky, distinguished visitors to the Rice campus, ladies and gentlemen, when I was approach with the idea of speaking at an event jointly sponsored by the uh, Human Genome Organization and the Baker Institute for Public Policy, I must confess that I hesitated a bit. Genetics, after all, is a very complicated subject, and it's one that I readily admit about which I know next to nothing. But my hesitation passed, and it passed quickly. And it did so because the Baker Institute is about building bridges bridges between domestic and foreign affairs, bridges between government and the private sector, and bridges between the study and the practice of public policy. And there is no more neglected bridge today than the one spanning the divide between the worlds of science and policy making. I see my presence here today as part of what will be, I hope, an abiding partnership between the Baker Institute and the scientific community. The task of the Human Genome Project in identifying and sequencing the 100,000 genes in the human genome is profound in its consequences, international in its scope, and vast not just in its ramifications for medicine, but for business, law, ethics, 
and public policy. And the Human Genome Organization, supported by government, by nonprofit organizations, and private business, representing the scientific communities of 13 participating countries and pursuing a research agenda that reaches beyond the end of the century, is as revolutionary as the genetic revolution that it seeks to harness in the cause of mankind. This morning, I'd like to discuss another revolution, a revolution in international affairs. Ironically, yesterday marked the first anniversary of President Clinton's inauguration, and not coincidentally, my own return to private life. <laughs> but if you would allow me, I would like to steer clear of one of those year-end assessments of the Clinton administration that have so consumed the, the American media in recent weeks. Although I will draw lessons from uh, developments over the last year where appropriate, uh, my emphasis instead will be on the future rather than on the past. I'm convinced that this emphasis is crucial because we are entering in a new period in international affairs, uh, a new period in American foreign policy, what we refer to as the post-Cold War era. And I think that the phrase itself is illuminating. It suggests just how young our current era truly is and how tentative our understanding of it still remains. We live tellingly in an age that has yet to acquire a name. I believe that today's state of world affairs resembles the periods of revolutionary science described by historian Thomas Kuhn, periods marked indeed by the consignment of one scientific paradigm to oblivion and the emergence of another to replace it. I believe that Kuhn's concept of paradigm or system can shed light on the uncertainties that we face in world affairs today. Kuhn stresses the twofold nature of any paradigm. First, as an explanation of reality, and second, as a tool for problem solving within that reality. With the eclipse of communism and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States has, in a very real sense, lost its main guiding principle for international affairs. And as we look to the future, we must learn to do without the explanation of international affairs that the Cold War provided for us and the tool for problem solving, known as containment, that saw us through to ultimate victory. Today, I think we're moving into this century's third great period in American foreign policy. The first lasted until 1941 with a brief interregnum during World War I. During this period, American foreign policy was guided, I think, by the principle of disengagement. I, believe, I think that that term is more accurate than the usual one of isolationism because it better captures, I think, the historic folly of that period. This is because America, as World War I demonstrated, really never was truly isolated. The United States' size, the large domestic market, and relative geographic remove allowed America to indulge in a fantasy of isolation. By the 1930s, that fantasy had grown quite frayed. Worldwide depression, the emergence of fascism, and the development of new weaponry had begun to erode even further the already shaky foundations of isolationism. Still, it took the shock of Pearl Harbor and the rigors of World War to rid America of that illusion. By disengagement, we had sought to isolate ourselves, but we'd failed. The second period, I think, began with America's entry into World War II. In it, American foreign policy was driven by what could be termed, I think appropriately, compulsory engagement. First fascist, and then communist aggression thrust the United States onto the world scene. The advent of nuclear weapons raised the international stakes for America to unprecedented heights. Not only our way of life, but our lives themselves were at risk. So we had no choice but to accept this reality. It was hard to argue the case for disengagement 
uh, when you had tens of thousands of nuclear warheads targeted on the United States by a hostile Soviet Union. In addition to the magnitude of the Soviet threat, there was its pervasiveness. Communist aggression made the entire world a field of contention. West and East competed, not just politically and militarily, but economically, technologically, and indeed socially. Today, with the end of the Cold War, we are entering yet a third distinct era in American foreign policy. That policy, I think, should be guided by the principle of selective engagement, a principle that embraces the freedom of action that we enjoy with the end of the Cold War, but recognizes at the same time the continued imperative of American leadership in the global arena. Selective engagement, or indeed any effective principle for foreign policy, has got to be based on a rigorous analysis of the world and a rigorous analysis of America's role in it. The first step, I think, is a clear comprehension of those global trends that are shaping our world today. The second would be a sober assessment of American interests. The third, a pragmatic recognition of competing American objectives. And the fourth, a firm understanding of the tangibles and intangibles of American power. So let me begin with the powerful global trends that are sweeping this world of ours today. In the geostrategic realm, the demise of the Soviet Union has decreased the risk of global thermonuclear war while increasing the possibility of lesser but still very, very dangerous conflict. International power has been diffused and international discipline has been loosened. Under these circumstances, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction raises the possibility of a new world disorder with a vengeance. In ideology, there's been a similarly ironic effect. The collapse of, world, of communism as a world force has spawned the rise of ultranationalist movements and leaders that threaten their citizens' freedom and that threaten their neighbors' security. Serbia's Milosevic, Russia's Zhirinovsky are just two prominent, if particularly sinister, examples of the reemergence of fascism as an international force. More generally, nationalism has created a potential zone of conflict that stretches from the Balkans through the Caucasus and into Central Asia. Turning to the diplomatic arena, the end of the Cold War has created the possibility of new international partnerships, most notably, for instance, between the United States and a democratic Russia. But it has also strained the Western alliance that fought and won the Cold War. With the end of the Soviet menace, North America, Western Europe, and Japan are looking at each other less as political partners and more as economic competitors. In economics, the rise of interdependence has both increased prosperity and, perversely, raised the domestic political stakes for trade and investment issues. The passage of NAFTA, the conclusion of the Uruguay Round, marks some welcome victories for the forces of economic liberalism. But the proponents of protectionism remain strong throughout the industrial democracies particularly as the United States, Western Europe, and Japan face the ever-growing competition provided by the dynamic economies of East Asia. Finally, the scientific and technological revolution has changed everything from the way we look at man to the way we work to the way we make war. I've already discussed some of the ramifications of the genetic revolution. Its example, I think, could be multiplied probably throughout the scientific disciplines. The emergence of information as a commodity, I think, has altered forever the nature of our domestic economies, as well as the terms and intensity of international competition. All of these trends are somewhat ambiguous, and indeed, they are often contradictory. They suggest the extent to which ours is a very complex and indeterminate world. At present, I think you'd have to say that no single one of these trends is dominant 
and the nature of the new order is far from set. In the late 1940s or early 1950s, in striking contrast, the American-Soviet rivalry would have led and indeed overwhelmed any list of international trends. This makes it critical that we pursue a strategy that is flexible enough to cope with today's turbulence. Such a strategy, of course, in turn depends upon a very careful analysis of America's interests. On one level, of course, our interests are simple and they're largely uncontested. Based upon the well-being of our citizens, these interests would include security, prosperity, and a promotion of American values. Move from generalization to specificity, however, and we at once enter a very much more complex area. Preventing, containing, and where possible, resolving regional conflict is, for instance, clearly a general American interest. Just as plainly, however, America's specific interest in avoiding conflict for instance, on the Korean Peninsula, differs in type and magnitude from our interest in, let's say, promoting a peaceful settlement in Angola. War in Korea would immediately involve thousands of American troops, and given North Korea's dangerous game of nuclear hide-and-seek, it would involve as well the potential use of atomic weapons. So in short, all interests are not equal, and our specific policies have to reflect this fact. Above all, these policies have to be proportionate to the American interests involved. Last year's fiascos in Haiti and Somalia can be traced at least in part, I think, to the lack of such a proportion. In Somalia especially, we saw what could be called mission creep, what began as a limited humanitarian mission grew to an ill-considered exercise in nation building with deadly consequences. I don't say that we had or have no interests in either country. Clearly, I think the United States does have an interest in encouraging democracy in Haiti, just as we do in averting human suffering in Somalia. But just as clearly, I think we'd have to admit that those interests are not of sufficient importance to squander American lives or to fritter away American prestige. Only a sense of proportion, I think, permits us to craft appropriate policies. We cannot solve every one of the world's problems. What we can and must do is focus our attention and our resources on the key challenges to our real vital interests. I discussed these at my inaugural lecture here at Rice last September. They include consolidating democracy and free markets in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, containing regional conflicts and stemming the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, strengthening an open global economic system, redefining this Western alliance of ours, and renewing American leadership. All of these challenges I think we would agree, share one common characteristic. Our success or failure in meeting them will directly affect the lives of Americans for years and decades to come. And I know of no better definition of a vital American interest. As we pursue American interests, however, we must recall that our approach to a specific country or region or issue can possess competing and sometimes contradictory objectives. Often our interests themselves will conflict. Sometimes our long and short-term goals will conflict. And I think it's important that we recognize these competing objectives. By doing so, we can make an informed choice among them, or preferably, we can craft a, poli a policy that balances them. American policy towards China, I think, is a good example of a case in point. Any list of American interests in China would include protection of human rights, market access for American firms, and Chinese cooperation on a range of international security issues, especially nonproliferation. 
Yet given the regime in Beijing, an absolutist American policy on human rights would undercut both our commercial interests and, to pick a topic uh, from today's headlines, our interest in denying North Korea nuclear weapons. Moreover, American efforts to promote human rights in China by diplomatic isolation and economic sanctions risks a backlash by the Chinese regime that would actually damage our long-term goal of Chinese democratization. Faced with such a circumstance, the Bush administration developed a China policy that pursued, through a mix of incentives and disincentives, all of our major interests in China. That policy, of course, seemed unsatisfactory to many, especially in the human rights community, but we, I think, had no real alternative without surrendering other important American interests and objectives. So balance in our policy towards China was critical, and I think balance in our policy toward China remains critical. And I happen to believe that that fact now seems to be sinking in on policymakers in Washington. The United States has recently faced yet another test of our ability to balance objectives, and it's one that I'm sorry to say I think we failed. I refer to expanding the membership of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Clearly, the United States has an interest in the independence of the newly democratic states of Eastern Europe. This independence, I think, can be best guaranteed through the promise of full NATO membership. Just as plainly, however, precipitous Eastern European membership in the North Atlantic Alliance could play into the hands of ultranationalists in Russia and damage the cause of reform, which of course is another vital American interest. Faced with these competing objectives, the Alliance, with its Partnership for Peace proposal, essentially temporized on the issue of Eastern European membership. By so choosing, NATO deferred by default, I think, to reactionary elements in Russia. I am convinced that a more innovative approach to NATO membership can better serve our interests both in Eastern Europe and in Russia. Promoting Eastern European security and promoting Russian democracy are not mutually exclusive. Specifically, I think that NATO should offer full membership to select Central and Eastern European countries. Take, for example, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic. Do that reasonably soon and leave membership open for the remainder of the new emerging democracies in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, including a democratic Russia. Once those countries institutionalize democracy, institutionalize free markets, responsible security policies, and above all else, a commitment to Helsinki principles. Such an approach would help consolidate democracy where it has already taken firm root in Warsaw, Budap Budapest, and Prague, while giving the other emerging democracies a concrete incentive to accelerate reform through the carrot of full NATO membership. Instead, I'm afraid that the alliance accepted a false choice between reform in Russia on the one hand and security in Eastern Europe on the other, thereby missing an opportunity to promote both. Assessing interests and balancing objectives, however, are not going to be enough. There must also be a firm understanding of the nature and exercise of American power. Today, the United States enjoys a preeminence in world affairs which is unique in history. That preeminence is perhaps most decisive in the military sphere. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and the demise of the Warsaw Pact, the United States no longer faces a global enemy. Our victory in the Gulf War demonstrated, I think, a capacity to project overwhelming military force half a world away, conventional military force. In short, American military supremacy today goes unchallenged. Any aggressor contemplation, contemplating action against the United States or its interests has to include the certainty of defeat in its calculations. America's international stature is also rooted in its economic strength. The recent recession and current restructuring of American industry have tended to obscure, I think, the underlying vitality of the American economy. 
Contrary to popular belief, our workers remain the world's most productive. Our export sector is the world's largest. And with congressional approval of NAFTA, the United States stands poised with Mexico and Canada to enjoy a market of over 350 million consumers. But the wellsprings of American influence transcend military might and they transcend economic vitality. They include a third intangible source, credibility. America's allies look to us with trust and they do so for a reason. Three times during this century, in two hot world wars and one cold one, the United States stood forthrightly with its friends against aggression and for freedom. More recently, President Bush declared that Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait would not stand and, of course, made good on America's pledge. Economic strength and military might are necessary but not sufficient causes of American power. There also has to be, ladies and gentlemen, a willingness to use that power and to use it consistently, decisively, and effectively. That willingness, that credibility, if you will, has been a crucial element of American leadership since World War II. However, if American leadership is to be sustained, American military might, economic power, and credibility have to be maintained. In defense policy, I think that the United States should reassess any further cuts whatsoever in force levels and preparedness. Twice before, after World Wars I and II, we neglected our armed forces, and we, and indeed the world, paid a price. As recently as the late 1970s, ours was a hollow army, an army of doubtful readiness and dubious morale, a state of affairs that took literally years to overcome. America's economic might, too, must be husbanded. Global interdependence has raised international competition to a new and intense pitch. How the United States addresses key domestic issues, such as the budget deficit, restructuring health care, and educational reform, will directly affect not only the prosperity of our citizens, but our international influence as well. But it is America's credibility today that I think is most at risk. Empty threats to use force in Bosnia, missteps in Haiti, and the tragedy in Somalia have all raised doubts about American resolve. These doubts go beyond American policy in the Caribbean, the Balkans, or the Horn of Africa. When America acts or fails to act, no matter where, the whole world watches and the whole world draws lessons. Let us hope that the most recent threat of military action to protect humanitarian assistance to Bosnia, for instance, proves less hollow than those earlier warnings. Similarly, I think our conciliatory stance toward Ukraine and North Korea run the risk of a constantly accelerating series of demands from the two states involved and perhaps from others. Every time this country issues an empty threat or every time we fail to insist upon our solemn international obligations, obligations from other nations, American power diminishes. I suspect that this lack of resolve in our foreign policy derives not only from confusion over our interests in this new era, but also a fundamental uneasiness with the concept of American power. Comfort with American power is a precondition, of course, to its competent exercise. During the Cold War, virtually every use of American power could be understood and explained to the American people as a response to the danger of Soviet totalitarianism. Today, of course, that argument is obsolete, and there is no similarly compelling calculus of force to replace it. Whether America uses its power alone or with others has to be based on pragmatic considerations. Alliances, whether formal or informal, and multilateral organizations such as the United Nations all represent means and not ends in the pursuit of American interests. 
Properly understood, multilateralism, coalition building, and unilateral action constitute instruments by which a strategy of selective engagement can be pursued. We need a choice not just of policies, but of instruments to implement them. Sometimes, as in support for a settlement in Cambodia, the United Nations will be the appropriate vehicle. Other times, as in support for reform in the Soviet Union, uh, we will have to form ad hoc coalitions with like-minded states. And as it did in Panama, the United States must always be prepared to act unilaterally when necessary, the still, still the oldest and surest test of a great power. I believe that American action against Iraqi aggression in the Gulf provides a model for the effective use of American power. It included, for instance, unilateral action in our decision to dispatch troops to Saudi Arabia in the immediate aftermath of the invasion of Kuwait. It embraced the creation of an ad hoc coalition, first to enforce economic sanctions, and then to finance and fight the war against Saddam Hussein. And it included resort to multilateral institutions like the United Nations to rally world opinion and to ensure universal compliance with Iraq's political and economic isolation. When we speak of selective engagement, I think the term itself explains much. First, it recognizes the idea of an America actively engaged in international affairs. It embraces the concept of an America not just in the world, but of it. Soviet expansion may have compelled American engagement after World War II, but post-war America's achievements were not limited to fighting and winning the Cold War. A global liberal economic regime, partnership with former adversaries like Germany and Japan, and the creation of a truly international community of democratic values spanning three continents and two great oceans were all, in a sense, part of the Cold War. But in another sense, they transcended it. All of them were products of American engagement. And American engagement remains no less imperative in today's world of fierce economic competition, burgeoning instability, and renascent fascism. In sum, the engagement aspect of selective engagement recognizes that disengagement today is simply not an option. Second, selective engagement stresses that American engagement means making choices. That is, selecting how and when and where we will engage. With America's emergence as the world's sole superpower, we enjoy unprecedented freedom of action today. In stark contrast with the Cold War, we confront today no single overwhelming threat to our interests. Ironically, America can do so much today that we're tempted to attempt everything or do nothing at all. This freedom makes it all the more imperative, I think, that our nation's leaders set clear, coherent, and comprehensive criteria for making these vital decisions. Above all, we need to act in proportion to our interests, we need to seek balance in our objectives, and we need to remain credible in the exercise of our policies. I make no grand claims for selective engagement. Other, more ambitious approaches may bring better theoretical order to today's uncertainties. Candidates range from that old standby balance of power realism to neo-mercantilism to the latest multilateral iteration of Wilsonianism to that newest entry, Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. Washington, of course, has embarked quite naturally on its own feverish search for containment's replacement. Senior officials have enunciated no less than six priorities, five questions, four goals, three pillars, two tendencies, and one strategy. I think it might be wise for all of us to focus less on grand theory and more on conceptual tools for the nitty-gritty work of solving problems. There are enough of them, from Bosnia to North Korea to the historic events that seem to unfold daily in Russia to keep us occupied for years. For at heart, foreign policy is not so much about creating a new world from a blank slate. Rather, it is about making a better world, 
a freer, more democratic, more secure, and more stable world from the rough, uncomfortable, and unpredictable reality of human action and human choice. It is about making history, because what is history fundamentally but the record of human decision? Perhaps the many scientists in the audience will be comfortable with the concept of problem solving. As Thomas Kuhn reminds us, most science reduces at root to just that. It is certainly possible to think about the Human Genome Project for all of its global scope and profound ramifications in precisely these terms, as a historic puzzle to be pieced together, as a huge riddle to be answered. I've always approached the conduct of foreign policy in this way, a reflection perhaps of my uh, admitted bias as a practitioner rather than a theoretician. But a problem-solving approach to foreign policy is also, I believe, justified by the revolutionary circumstances in which we find ourselves. The contours of the current era are only slowly emerging, so intellectual modesty is in order and perhaps a little reading of history. In retrospect, new eras seem to emerge fully formed from the periods that precede them. At the time, however, I submit to you that the reality is different. Five years passed between the end of World War II and the promulgation of containment as official American policy in NSC 68. Five years that appeared chaotic to those that lived through them. Like us, they were finding their way, and like us, finding themselves as they did so. In conclusion, I'm reminded of something once noted by Dean Acheson, who served at the highest levels of the State Department from 1941 to 1953, a period that in some respects provides a compelling parallel to our own. In his incomparable memoir, Present at the Creation, Secretary Acheson wrote that the task before America after World War II appeared only a bit less formidable than that described in the first chapter of Genesis. The same can be said, I think, of the task confronting American foreign policymakers today and of the many scientists here and around the world embarked on the great adventure called the Human Genome Project. So as we look to the very different but comparably daunting tasks ahead, I think it might be useful for us to reread Genesis and remember that even God, wise beyond all human comprehension, took creation a single day at a time. Thank you all very, very much. We will have a question and answer period. I do believe we have the portable microphones. If you would raise your hand, uh, I will recognize you. I think I'll begin and go from my left to my right. Gentleman in the back. Would you comment on your hopes and fears for the control and proliferation of biological weapons? Well, I uh, mentioned that uh, as one of the major challenges uh, facing American uh, policymakers, foreign and security policymakers, uh, in my inaugural lecture here in September, and then I referred to it briefly uh, again here today, and I think it is indeed uh, one of the major challenges, and not just biological weapons, but uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. Uh, I am not particularly sanguine about the prospects uh, of controlling uh, proliferation. A lot will depend upon what happens uh, in terms of uh, the reform uh, process in uh, some of the states of the former Soviet Union. A lot will depend upon how disciplined the West is in enforcing political and economic sanctions against would-be proliferating nations like North Korea, like Iran, and others. And uh, a lot, I think, will depend upon, uh, upon uh, how forceful 
Uh, we in the United States are in maintaining that essential element of credibility that I spoke about. I, you might have noted where I mentioned our approach toward Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine has promised us on two prior occasions in a solemn treaty that they signed with the United States that they would sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and, uh, and uh, ratify the, the uh, START uh, treaty that we negotiated uh, with the former Soviet Union. They failed to do either one. We now have yet a third promise from them, and I hope that they, uh, I hope that they will keep this promise. Uh, the argument that these weapons need to be retained as a defense against Russia falls on deaf ears as far as I'm concerned because these strategic nuclear weapons in Ukraine, and no, no one ought to forget this in this country, are not targeted on Moscow. And in fact, they are too long range to even reach Moscow, as I understand it, they are targeted on Washington, New York, who knows, maybe Houston. So we should be insisting on the fulfillment of solemn obligations to the United States. Long-winded answer to your question, I'm not particularly optimistic about our ability uh, to control would-be proliferators. There's a temptation on the part of a lot of people in a lot of countries in the West to make an extra uh, dollar here or there by uh, dealing with uh, some of these uh, countries that, that might proliferate. It is one of the foremost challenges, though, facing, uh, facing the United States uh, foreign policy today. We'll take a question from the center. Yeah, I think there's a parallel. I think that um, if you, if we could ever see a, a, a peaceful situation in uh, the former Yugoslavian uh, republics, it's quite possible that some of them, uh, not those that have uh, participated in and practiced, uh, let's say, genocide, not those who have, who have um, created the humanitarian nightmare that is there today, but you take a country like, for instance, uh, Slovenia fairly stable, uh, quite democratic, quite Western in its approach. It's possible down the line that that might be uh, a candidate. I think uh, first that situation there needs to be, needs to, uh, needs to be dealt with in some way and unfortunately I think the only way is going to be when they get tired of, uh, of killing each other as they've been doing for 2,000 years. I think that will ultimately happen. Question from the right. We'll work around in cycles. The question from over on the right-hand side. No, then back over here to the left. Thanks. In your um, form formula for selective engagement, do you uh, advocate more of a role with the UN, or do you see it as I see it as a paper tiger that has inherent flaws? Can it be improved, or is it always going to have the problems that it has today? I think uh, the, w one of the goals of, uh, of our participation uh, in United Nations activities in uh, recent years, and this is on a bipartisan basis, uh, both Republican and Democratic administrations, has been to reform some of the practices of the uh, United Nations and the, uh, and the bureaucracy there. I think those badly need to be done. Uh, I think that there is a role for the United Nations in certain, at certain times and certain places. I mentioned Cambodia in my remarks as a good example of where the United Nations is perhaps the best instrumentality or vehicle to deal with a problem. Uh, the United Nations was critical in the Gulf War. Uh, without the, the Security Council resolutions uh, condemning Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and dealing with the economic and political consequences of it, we would never have been able to isolate Iraq in the way that we were able to do so. Uh, again, there needs to be, I think, American engagement and American leadership. Where it, even, when you're, even when you're using a multilateral organization like the United Nations. And uh, I think if we and our allies, because we got strong support from uh, but particularly the, uh, the, those allies of ours on the, uh, on the, uh, with permanent seats on the Security Council, without that kind of leadership, the United Nations is not going to be as effective as it would be with it. But there will be some roles and times for the United Nations, I think, to, uh, to play. Senator back row.
Well, it's a case of, as I said in my remarks, it's a case of balancing our interests, maintaining a sense of proportionality, uh, never losing, never diminishing our credibility, if you will, by our own actions. Never threaten force unless we're going to use it. Uh, that's, uh, that's one thing that uh, we should certainly always uh, be conscious of. We should also hold nations to their solemn agreements with us. The minute we start backing off and trading down from something that uh, has been agreed to, we lose credibility. There were many times in the Gulf War where various countries who were supporting our approach came to us and said, look, uh, we think we can get Iraq out of Kuwait if you'll just agree to deal, let's say, with the, uh, with the uh, Arab-Israeli problem, or if you'll just agree to do this or do that. We were never willing to trade down one inch from the United Nations Security Council resolutions, and I think you have to, you have to uh, adopt that approach uh, in order to maintain our credibility. Now, the, the determination about whether to go in or not to go in is, is critical, and there will be some instances where we have sufficient national interests involved, including support for the principles that we hold dear, democratization and uh, freedom of the individual and uh, opposition to genocide, uh, where we'll decide to go in. But there'll be times when we won't, and we just must be very, very clear. Let me give you an example. We felt it was important in the closing days of the Bush administration to do what we could with respect to the humanitarian suffering in Somalia. So we started a, a, humani a humanitarian uh, intervention. We were asked by the United Nations to disarm the, the clans, and we said, absolutely not. We will not take that on as an obligation. Uh, and, we're, and our people are going to be in there, or they're going to be out of there in 90 to 100 days. We'll set up a feeding program, and then we're out. Now, after we left, that mission expanded to one of nation building. We don't have a, uh, a national interest in the United States in nation building. And so I think you, we need to stand up at the very beginning and say things like that. Here's where we will go in, and here's where we, we won't. Clearly, you have to look at each case on the basis of its own facts. Bosnia. I don't think the American people would support for two days uh, taking casualties on the ground in, uh, in Sarajevo. And therefore, our administration and the Clinton administration are, were both opposed to uh, putting, forced, putting American uh, men and women at risk on the ground in Bosnia. Uh, the use of uh, air and naval gunfire was a different matter. But I think that's the right, uh, th those were the right decisions. And, and I think you just, you just need to stand up and say that at the beginning, rather than suggesting somehow that maybe you will in order to mollify uh, human rights critics uh, on one side of the debate. Center front. I am Sabir Amawi, the Consul of Jordan. Mr. Baker, as an experienced statesman, how would you project and predict the leadership, prominence, and st strength of the United States in the 21st century as we approach very near? I think that, uh, that the United States, uh, and uh, the reason I uh, have proposed the, uh, the concept of selective uh, engagement, and you'll note I said it's very important that we remain engaged, uh, uh, is that the United States is going to maintain a leadership role going into the 21st century. I do not buy the argument that some make that the United States is growing weaker. Uh, I think that, uh, as I indicated in my remarks, that uh, this economy of ours is a lot stronger than people think it is. It's still more than twice as big as uh, any other economy, and I think that we will be involved and engaged and in a leadership role well into the 21st century. And I mentioned our military uh, uh, ability. Right hand side. The mic is coming. Oh. Uh, First, the lady, and then we'll get to. Would you comment on the situation in the Mideast and Assad's initiative? Uh, first of all, I, I strongly supported uh, the, uh, the uh, current administration in their meeting with President Clinton and his meeting with uh, President Assad. 
Uh, it, Prime Minister Rabin himself said, you don't make peace uh, with friends, you make peace with enemies. And you can't make peace if you're not willing to talk to somebody. And uh, I do not believe uh, that the Arab governments would have changed their policies of 40 years and come to Madrid in 1991 if we hadn't spent an awful lot of time with President Assad and if he hadn't made a decision to come sit down with Israel. So I think that uh, when he says uh, he's ready for peace with Israel, he's ready for a normal peace, uh, I think that, uh, that he means uh, what he says. It's obviously got to be something within the context of 242, the United Nations Resolution 242, uh, Territory for Peace. But I think I'm optimistic about what uh, might well happen soon. I think that the labor government uh, in Israel today is uh, leaning very, very far forward for peace. And I think that the, that the Israeli body politic has concluded that they are tired of being a nation constantly at war, and they want peace, and therefore I'm very optimistic. Now there's a lot of, there's still a lot to be done, and, uh, and uh, we'll see, I think a lot, I think we'll see a lot more time elapse before we actually get there, but, uh, but all the, uh, what's happened is good in my opinion. Right hand side. You have a perspective and insight that very few people on the planet can claim, and Rice's gain is sometimes, I think, Washington's or America's loss. How can this institute still affect the policies with which you want to study? Can we only study them, or can we actually affect them from this vantage point? When uh, President uh, Rupp, when George Rupp and uh, Charles Duncan, the chairman of Rice's board, came to see me in the aftermath of the uh, election, and we sat there in my office uh, in the White House, and they talked to me about this concept. I said I would be interested in looking into it, uh, provided uh, I knew that the support would be there from Rice, and I need to parenthetically add here, it really has been there in a tremendous way from Rice. Uh, and I'm very pleased with the progress that we've been able to make so far in the development program and every, everything else. But I said I would like to do it, provided you think that Rice University would be interested in a pu public policy institute that would try and bring together people from the world of ideas and people from the world of action and have a mix between the two. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars in the Smithsonian was founded on this principle. It's a creature of the Congress. I've been a board member of that institution for almost 20 years, uh, since 1976. And it's, a, it's an outstanding institution and, uh, and yet I see that the public policy institutes in this country are on our coasts. They're uh, on the East Coast or they're on the West Coast. And I think a public policy institute in the heartland of the country that, that has as its goal uh, bridging the gap between the world of ideas and the world of action uh, can be a very, very useful thing. Left-hand side, down. I'm a European from the UK and I listened to your talk with great interest but perhaps a little concern uh, at the lack of uh, reference to Europe uh, as an organization and, and at the emphasis inevitably on American values, which however historically have a great deal to owe to European values. I wonder what you would say uh, about the future that you see in the relationship between America and Europe. Well, I don't see uh, anything but a, uh, but, a, but a very close and strong continuing relationship between the United States and Europe. I frankly think uh, that, uh, that um, uh, the current uh, administration got, off, got into a little trouble by talking about their emphasis on Asia. Uh, I think it was misinterpreted to some extent. I don't think they intended to say that they're going to disregard Europe. Europe has always been extraordinarily important in our calculus. In fact, we were sometimes accused of being Eurocentric, but uh, during the years that the world changed when we were in office there, the Berlin Wall was coming down, there was an end of the East-West confrontation, a lot of things were happening that were, that were Europe-centered. Having said all that, the, uh, the United States is both an Atlantic power and a Pacific power. And, and we, we uh, it is very important to us uh, that we pay attention to, uh, to events uh, across the Atlantic as well as events across the Pacific. And fortunately, we have friends uh, in both places and some really, really good friends. And, 
And uh, I don't suggest uh, for one minute that uh, American uh, principles and values don't have a heritage going way, way back to uh, many of our closest uh, allies in Europe. I don't mean to suggest that at all. In the back. Uh, uh, Secretary Baker, I think there are many who would want to add to your list of the most fundamental trends shaping the global, the global uh, world and in terms of American vital self-interest, the threats to the global economy, the world population, the destruction of the, of the tropical rainforest, the ozone layers, and so I wondered uh, whether you would comment on that and whether you see that as, in fact, a critically important part of the future foreign policy agenda for the United States? Well, I, th I, I see environmental uh, concerns as uh, occupying a greater and greater role in our foreign policy uh, calculations in Washington. Uh, we were very active when I was there in uh, areas of rainforest preservation, particularly in uh, eliminating the uh, practice worldwide of drift net fishing, uh, you know, uh, making sure we uh, got the elephants listed on the CITES list and all of these things. Uh, there is now a, uh, an even greater emphasis on the environment through the establishment in the department of a, uh, of a position that uh, former Senator uh, Worth of Colorado uh, is, uh, is holding uh, that, 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 look, that deals with uh, environmental concerns. And I do, I do accept the, uh, the uh, argument that there can be serious environmental threats uh, to our uh, to our world, but I think again it's a matter of balance, and we have to be very careful that we balance the environmental considerations and the development considerations. Uh, and I think we're fully capable of doing that. But environment, I can promise you, is becoming more and more of an of a uh, of a consideration in the development of our uh, of our foreign policy. I'll give you an example from my days at the Treasury Department. We uh, we worked very, uh, very closely with like-minded countries to, to see to it that the World Bank established an environmental office in the bank so that environmental considerations could be uh, taken into account in the granting of development loans to countries. Right here. <clears throat> Mr. Baker, during uh, your lecture, it seems there are not much attention seems to have been given to uh, certain other areas of the world. Except for the Somali case, I didn't heard any other mention about Africa. And uh, I'd also like uh, to know if you would make some comments on uh, Southern America, most of all taking into consideration the results of the Uruguay round. Thank you. The results of what, sir? Of the Uruguay round. Oh, the Uruguay round. Um, I think that um, developments in this hemisphere uh, have been uh, extraordinarily productive in terms of our principles and values. There was a period uh, before there was a slight reversal uh, in Peru, and I think they're coming out of that now, if I may say so, but uh, there was a period when I was Secretary of State where every country in this hemisphere was democratic with the sole exception of Cuba, something that was unheard of or what, that if, that if anybody had uh, wanted to bet you would happen back in 1981 when I first went to Washington, uh, anybody would have taken that bet and given odds. But, but it happened. Uh, I think that, uh, that NAFTA is going, as I mentioned in my remarks, is going to generate an awful lot of economic activity. I personally have called for the extension of free trade agreements uh, between the United States and countries in South America, uh, countries that uh, have locked in free market reforms and free enterprise. But you see democratic countries throughout the hemisphere now, and you see countries that have committed themselves to the free market, countries that used to have an extraordinarily uh, statist and centrally planned uh, economy. Uh, right behind you, and then we'll go over here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to return to this gentleman in the back, his question on this criteria for U.S. Uh, action and non-action. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us, um, within the framework of this selective engagement that you've outlined for us, um, why should we, why did we decide to intervene in Somalia and not Haiti? Why was Somalia worthy of our compassion and not Haiti? I think that uh, Haiti is very much worthy of our compassion 
But the question was whether or not you could uh, insert military forces uh, in a nonviolent way. And we were never assured that we could assert that we could insert military forces in Haiti in a nonviolent way. And uh, as I said before, we, of course, we have a, a national interest in seeing democracy uh, restored to Haiti. But I don't think at the cost of, uh, of uh, American lives, at least that's, uh, that was our view. Uh, so that's the, why we had the difference between the two countries. We could go into Somalia, set up a secure environment for, uh, for establishing humanitarian feeding programs, and, and save literally thousands of lives. Uh, with all of the problems in Haiti, people were not starving the way they were in Somalia. You had a, you had a, 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 a military overthrow of a democratically elected president, but you didn't have the humanitarian nightmare in Haiti that you had in Somalia. And uh, there was a, there would have been a, no, that would have been a non-consensual insertion of military force. Perhaps two more questions? Okay. Yes. Um, in your lecture, you've concentrated in the critical areas of the world. Now, there are several non-critical areas. In, uh, and as we enter the 21st century, we have increasing population, poverty, hunger, and they run the risk of becoming critical in the future, such as Latin America right now, India, and how do you see a preventive role of the United States in uh, conducting the world into the 21st century in, uh, under those guidelines? Well, it, you know, we, we are engaged in those areas in the world, but it's a question of the extent and scope of our engagement. I said in an earlier lecture, I don't think the United States should be looked upon to be the policeman of the world, and we are not going to be able to prevent problems from developing uh, in a lot of places around the world, and we shouldn't pretend that we can. Uh, we are engaged in the, in the uh, areas that you mentioned through representation. We have, uh, we have uh, diplomatic relations. We have political dialogue and all of that. If a crisis uh, erupts, then we will, have to make the, uh, we will have to make the determination of whether or not that uh, jurisdiction justifies a more extensive engagement. There is some engagement now in all of those places you mentioned. Right behind you, right beside you. Well, uh, uh, now the, the, inspection of, the inspection of nuclear installations, installations in North Korea is one of the touching issues in the world. Well, uh, it, it is done under, dealt with under the uh, NPT regime. Don't you think that uh, the total elimination of nuclear power instead of the NPT regime is a better way to solve uh, the question? Because the total, uh, total elimination of uh, uh, nuclear uh, nuclear the total uh, elimination denuclearization yes, right. of uh, no yeah. I don't yeah. I think that, I think that the presence of the nuclear threat uh, by the United States has maintained the peace on the Korean Peninsula for a long time and uh, we've had the. We've had the nuclear weapon for a long time, too, since about 19... Because sometimes the NPT regime is criticized as a way to perpetuate, to perpetuate the nuclear power's pre, uh, prerogative. Well, we haven't, seen, we, haven't seen, we haven't seen a nuclear war since, uh, since uh, 1945 when uh, the nuclear uh, uh, capability was developed, which would indicate to me that the, that the NPT is working, so far at least, reasonably well. Uh, I don't think that you can, uh, that you can draw, uh, uh, I don't think that you can suggest that there's an equivalency here between uh, the United States' possession of nuclear capability and the way we use it on the Korean Peninsula and North Korea's uh, desire to develop a bomb. I just don't accept the, the, that there's any uh, moral or, or other equivalency there. And what I would be doing with North Korea is I would be into the Security Council. I would have been in there, I think, uh, some time ago, uh, dealing with that threat in the same way that we uh, dealt with the Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. And I do not think for one minute that, the, that our Chinese friends would veto that because I don't think China wants to see a regime like the North Korean regime develop a nuclear capability on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and instead of trying to 
compromise and deal with them and say, well, if you'll show us two sites but not two others, maybe we can start doing some economic trade and stuff. I think we ought to go into the Security Council and get some sanctions against their continuing refusal to meet their obligations to the International Atomic Energy Agency. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I have no doubt at all that we, that we could all profitably uh, benefit from a dozen more questions, but other scheduled considerations do intervene. <laughs> to members of the Human Genome Organization, thank you, and thank you for uh, coming to Rice and to Houston uh, in your deliberations. We hope that you will set standards for international cooperation and collaboration in science that we can follow in many other fields. To the members of the Consular Corps who are here today, and there are many of you, thank you also for coming. Rice students, faculty, citizens of Houston, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Thank you.